we have a small group today, but I think that's fine. We're going to go ahead and get started. And if others join us um, as we go along, that will be great. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here today to our talk. My name is Denise Blair, and I'm the Director of Education at the Michigan State University Museum. And this talk is part of an ongoing series for our newest exhibit, which is called Beyond the Black Panther, Visions of Afrofuturism in American Comics. And I will go ahead and put the address in because the online exhibit, this is purely virtual exhibit, is now available. Um, so I will go ahead and put this in the chat. And if you have a chance, you can go to the exhibit page and visit us. All right, so today we welcome uh, Tim Fielder and he will be discussing his newest work called Infinitum, an Afrofuturist Tale. And uh, after the talk, we have a short survey for you. If you wouldn't mind hanging around for a couple of minutes and filling that out, letting us know about your experience today, that would be much appreciated. And then also a reminder that Dr. Chambliss will be um, giving a talk um, on April 7th at 11 o'clock Eastern. So if you can join us for that next event, please do so. And then also just a quick reminder that today's session will be recorded. So as uh, we get started here, I'll let Dr. Chambliss take it over and introduce our wonderful speaker. Uh, thanks, Denise. Uh, thanks for all of you out there who join us. Of course, my name is Julian Chambliss. I'm in the Department of English here at MSU, and I'm also the Val Perriman Curator of History at the MSU Museum. Uh, it's my great honor to be the curator for uh, Beyond the Black Panther and to have the opportunity to talk to the great artist and storyteller, storyteller Tim Fielder. Uh, Tim is a well-known and um, I think much beloved Afrofuturist uh, artist who's been working in the field of comics and animation for more than 20 years, uh, educator and the author of Maddie's Rocket, which is uh, his previous Afrofuturist tale. <laughs> But uh, there's no question that um, in the context of a contemporary moment, his latest book, Infinitum, and I'm proud to say I have my, my copy of Infinitum here, uh, has just come out only a few weeks ago and has been well received and well regarded. We have the honor of having uh, work from Tim in Beyond the Black Panther, uh, the show at the MSU Museum. The goals of that show to really were to spotlight the diverse nature of Afrofuturist themes in American comics, in particular those comics produced by African American curators. So in this conversation, of course, we are going to talk about Infinito, but I also want to um, get Tim to reflect a little bit on some of his views about uh, sort of visual culture around Afrofuturism and broader questions of representation and aesthetics associated with uh, Afrofuturism in the United States. So Tim, thank you for taking the time on, on our schedule. I know it's very busy to talk to us uh, today. <laughs> what? Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm busy. I'm not that busy, man. Come on, man. <laughs> well, you know, I always like to, to start out with uh, a really basic yeah. question of, how do you define Afrofuturism? And, and the reason I asked that question is not because uh, it's a difficult question necessarily, but because I think for a lot of people, especially right now, this is a term that has moved from periphery really to the center of a kind of cultural conversation in the United States. And yes. it's the work of people like yourself that are really sort of front and center in that contemporary conversation. So. For people out there who are interested, how do you define Afrofuturism? Okay, so you asked multiple questions. So I'll start with what I think Afrofuturism is and, and talk about the state. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, all right. So Afrofuturism is uh, in a longer form, the intersection of race, race politics, technology, social and societal movements. And it's all of the forms that emanate from that intersection, that collision of material. And it could be done in the form of art. It could be done in the form of prose. It can be done in the form of comics, which is what my specialty is. It can be done in the form of academics, which is what Julian and, and, and uh, his crew do. 
And um, that's what it is. And there, you have certain aspects of Afrofuturism that have more maturity than others. So for example, in the prose area, you have decades of maturity. You have all the way back to W.E. Du Bois, you know, with his book, The Comet, uh, his story, The Comet. It's like those were black speculative stories featuring a black main character created by a black person. Uh, but then you could go all the way up to obviously Samuel R. Delaney, Octavia Butler, and then you have some of the modern day practitioners like uh, 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 N.K. Jemison, uh, uh, P.J. Clark things like that. And I guess, you know, in the visual part, that would be me, you know, uh, 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 the people who are coming from the Megascope line are part of that. Those books will be, well, After the Rain, uh, written by uh, Nettie Okorafor is, is, is African futurism, <clears throat> but it's, you know, they're, they're all in the same thingy, you know, I, I won't go too deeply into that. But those projects all in the same arena of a thought. Um, the visual component is not, it's, it's has its development, I would say, going back, because you've ha always had Black folks doing comics, right? Uh, the new book by Ken Quattro, uh, Invisible Men, talks about that. Matt Baker, you know, uh, uh, but then you have people who came like in comic strips, Bromsic, Brandon Jr. But when you're talking about science fiction, meaning I, I classify as non-superhero, you know, cause that's its own category. That's its own category. Mm -hmm. And there are many, you know, Billy Graham, Dennis Cowan, and those guys have been doing that stuff for years. But when you're talking about straight science fiction, that's a dicier concept. So with that, what has been happening is I have been doing straight science fiction with black characters for many, many decades, for better and for worse. <laughs> and although I've done the work in good times and bad times, when there was like zero interest, like zero, less than zero, now there is massive, massive interest. And the state, which segues into my next answer, of, of, of Afrofuturism on the planet Earth is good. <laughs> and I am very, 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 very happy, very happy <laughs> to be here and to be present and productive and active at this moment in time. It is almost like, you know, I'm not super religious, but it's like, Moses in the desert, man. It's like, <laughs> you know, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like, certainly there's an interest in what I do and what the community of folks around me, what they do. And I have been given this tremendous opportunity. You know, those folks lost their mind. Let me do this book. This is amazing. And uh, it's part of history now. You know what I mean? Right. Which is weird for me. You know, it's like, I've worked in pretty, I, I, I'm gonna be kind and say relative obscurity, but it's pretty like, pretty like dense, dense obscurity for decades. And now to finally be here with a book that's everywhere and it's about to go bigger in the next 24 to 48 hours, wherever our UK launched in another, what, week and a half. So yeah, it's, you know, I'm having a ball. I'm just loving it. I am loving it. Well, it's amazing to, to think about um, someone, as you say, who's who's been working in a field, uh, telling stories of a form that is a little bit, has been niche, but now the world has sort of caught up with you. Yeah. And I'm I'm really curious in in the context, especially of um, my goals of thinking about the opportunity represented by your work, mm -hmm. that there's a critical, I sometimes talk about a critical geography in comics, that the, the stories in comics are rooted in particular places. And I'm mindful of the fact that your earlier work that's featured in the show is Maddie's Rocket, mm -hmm. which I think of as a really um, symbolic work that ties into a kind of 
imagination around the Southern Black experience. Thank you. That is is really compelling, I think, for for people who haven't read it. And I also think of it as, as some way, at some level, a, a kind of all ages story um, that is is very appealing versus this sort of contemporary work that is at, in, infinitum which is in every way, shape or form a very much a graphic novel, right? It's a story for adults mm -hmm. uh, and, and the span of time involved in infinitum is, is the title um, suggests infinite. So as a, as a creator who has thought long and hard about these, these things, what's the value for you in telling those sort of at some level hyper-personal regional stories about blackness in, in a sci-fi perspective versus something like Infinitum, which as I say, I think reflects a kind of global diasporic consideration of blackness. I mean, right. those are, they're very different things. And it's important, I think, for people to know what they seek out Maddie's Rocket, they're getting a very different thing right. from Infinitum. Okay, so honestly, the American South is part of the African diaspora. It right. Is. Oh, I'm sorry. I probably shouldn't have said it like that. <laughs> <laughs> but let me reword it. The American South is part of the African diaspora. It is. There's Negroes everywhere, everywhere, right? Uh, and people of color have been there since its inception in its present form, before there were people of color who are still there, right? I'm a descendant of both uh, Africans, Caucasians, and Native Americans. Maddie Waddy, who's in this book, Maddie's Rocket, is named after a full-blooded Choctaw Indian, Native American. Uh, so the history of America is complicated and intertwined with multiple ethnicities, genders, and races. All right, so we got that part out of the way. Uh, Afrofuturism, which is a term, Mark Derry created the term, coined the term, uh, back in 93, I think. Mm -hmm. And you know, he was just using a term to describe something that was already in existence, which is what, why you coin terms, right? You know, Star Trek called them communicators, but we call them cell phones, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's important to keep that particular aspect in terms of origins and not get so clamped down into terminology and get more involved in practice. And practice means producing, producing products, products. What is it? Okay, you're, you're writing about this. Okay, but what are you writing? When does it come to an end? When is it finished? I'm, I'm big on finishing things, particularly now. Uh, so Afrofuturism in its present form is something that is dynamic. I hope I'm answering your question here. It's dynamic, it has, uh, style, it is spiritual, you know, cause for me it was like for years and years and years, it was very much a, you know, oh, I, I, I'm compelled to draw these characters, you know, further answering your question with black characters in these speculative scenarios, because I was just driven to do it. You know, I just was, you know, I, I've, you know, with the attention that's coming to my work now, it's forced me to kind of look back on things and to see where I've come from to say, okay, you know, all right, so how did I get here? You know, how did I, how did the world get here? Cause that's the other thing. It's like, yeah, I'm here, but now the world has shifted underneath my feet. It's like the matrix, you know, <laughs> you're, you're out of the thing and there's this tube stuck out of your back of the head, which is dustly the red tie, I took the red tie, you know? So I feel like it's a tremendous time, I believe, that Afrofuturism has the potential to change the world in a longer term sense. I think it's very holistic. Uh, 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 you know, I don't know how much time I will be able to produce. Um, 
you know, and, and I'm sorry if my question seemed a little bit meandering, but it, I just, I, I just don't, if it felt like, like enormously grateful to be able to do what you do. Oh man. I just, that's, I know that's not the academic science scholarly <laughs> answer that you guys might want, but dude, man, you got to know, man, you got to know, you've got to know. I feel like my work, you know, I'm not perfect, but I feel like my work can be just as dense in the science fiction genre as Asimov, as Arthur C. Clarke, who had a heavy influence on Infinitum. Uh, but I also feel like it, I can make the same type of statement as what happens in the film space. You know, when you look at my book, everybody says it's like a movie. Well, that was intentional. So I'm dealing in multiple different areas within the Afrofuturist space. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what's going on. And it's a very fluid thing. It's a very okay. fluid thing. You know, one, one of the things I like about what you just said is that, and as we were, as I was thinking about trying to capture, uh, as you say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that landscape around the Black speculative tradition, right? You know, when you look at Afrofuturism, there are certain themes that I think are very common. Aesthetics, which you mentioned, metaphysics, which you mentioned, uh, gender, you know, a sort of uh, intersectionality, um, I think is very important. A science, right, a different take on science and, and community. These are, these are the themes that really sort of motivate, motivate um, the show. And in Imp an Item, I think you can, you can see all of that play itself out, that they're literally every one of those things uh, are central to the story. So for people who have not, you may have only sort of like seen a little bit of the book and, and um, heard the buzz. How would you describe infinitum to a person to get them like, this is how you just think of it? All right. I'm going to give you the macro answer. I'm going to give you <clears throat> the micro answer. The macro answer is, uh, well, let's go with the micro answer first. The micro answer story-wise involves, it because infinitum is for grown folk. It's for adults, right? Uh, meaning that I deal with mature storylines uh, because I'm trying to make specific points. Uh, Infinitum is about an ancient African warlord named Aja Oba, who is a warlord in the best kind of traditions of the Charles Saunders, Robert E. Howard, type of barbarian myth. I wanted to go back that and to observe what black life could be, but from a visual standpoint in that arena. So that's one aspect of Afrofuturism. Then I wanted to, he, Aja in, in conjunction with his wife, the queen, they can't have kids. So they make a really bad decision of taking a child from one of Oba's lovers. And he is cursed, Oba is cursed with the gift of immortality, thus cursing him to live for eons. <laughs> Seeing his loved ones, the cities and the com communities and the, the, all of the different aspects of life withered to dust as he continues to live. Uh, and this goes on uh, to the story uh, as a narrative device to both show drama, but also to show all of the different aspects of what Afrofuturism is, what it is now, and what it can be in the future. And I did that, and I've said this before, and I'll say it uh, here for MSU. Uh, the people who carried me from, and in terms of the Afrofuturist community, you know, I had my family, I had my, my very good friends, but in terms of the Afrofuturist community, this book was really workshop by them. They allowed me to workshop. One of the earliest workshops I had was at a BSAM, Black Speculative Arts Movement thing founded by Ronaldo Anderson. Uh, I think it was at a Tanisha Taylor's event that was in San Antonio, Texas back in like 2017, right? Well, and that wasn't even the first time. 
You mean black I, and brown planets? Black and brown planets. It was one of those. It was yeah. one of those. There's a ton of them. But right. I was able to show infinitum at, a, at multiple BSAMs. I was able to show it there. And part of what it allowed me to do was to show the story in a kind of rough form, black and white drawings to, to gauge audience reaction. And this went on till the book was completed in March of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Afrofuturist community, particularly the scholars and the academics have really allowed me to, to be who I am. And I have a great deal of affection for them. I mean, they're not perfect. They're crazy, just like everybody else. You know, let's not get it twisted. But, but the Afrofuturist, the academic community has allowed me to consistently be able to showcase to their students, to be able to implant myself, frankly, very frankly, into history. Because when you're part of the academic history, you're part of history that is being written. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. Uh, 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 Father, you know, it's, it's, it's so, I, I hate to use the word funny, <laughs> but it was something I was telling Stacey Robinson students yesterday. I was saying, never allow someone else to determine what is written on your history. Even though someone else will write your history, but you have to make sure that you give them at least notes. And, and I mean that, I mean that. And who's best qualified to do that? Academics. You have to make sure you're actually on the field of play to become a part of the play. And that's what infinitum is. So infinitum serves that purpose as a dense, dense, massive, fully rendered epic that will allow a person to in one book say, this is what Afrofuturism is. This is what it can be. This is what it will be. You know, that's a really interesting answer um, for a variety of reasons, of course. Some of the, the, the people you're, you're referring to are, are our mutual friends and colleagues. Uh, Kenitra Brooks is the person who organized Black and Brown Planets at the University of San Antonio. Uh, University of Texas at San Antonio, yep. which was a, a great event. Uh, and I do remember you being there because I, I was there too. Um, yep. And it's one of the things about uh, your answer is this sort of recognition as many artists, many, many serious artists do, they, they, they talk about legacy and they talk about the need to, to you know, the be in, in conversation uh, with certain institutions, certain other artists, they want to be in collections and so on and so forth. And it's ironic because you as a, as a graphic novelist, as a person associated with comics in the United States, at least, comics are, are burdened by a kind of juvenile uh, association, like comics are for kids, right? This, this sort of classic thing. But mm -hmm. as a novelist, as a speculative novelist, right. um, in the context of Infinitum, you're telling as you say, a story that would, um, you know, it has it has elements that remind me a little bit of Dune. Uh, it has <laughs> elements that remind me of classic works from the 19th century. You know, one of the things about uh, Infinitum right. is that it reminds right. me a lot of a little bit of Martin R. Delaney, um, Robeson Delaney. Which I hope to adapt one day, Blake. <laughs> Blake, right? Yeah, because the the character is moving through time. He tries to because, found his own kingdom. That right. wasn't. When you're, but see, that's what I'm saying. I'm projecting here because you're not imagining the connection. You're actually seeing the connection. I'm telling you that was intentional. <laughs> okay. Okay. You, no, I'm serious. No, Blake no, no. Yeah, yeah. Tries to have his own thing. I'm telling right. you, that's what it was. Right. Right. Yeah, and for and for the audience, for people listening to this, they, they don't know Blake, but but if you know Blake, this right. story. Martin Delaney wrote this book in Martin the R. Delaney, uh, right, 19th like, century. Yeah, 1859, right? Right, and um, it was serialized at first. Serialized, yeah. And it was collected, it was basically a story about a black man who becomes involved in a revolutionist movement where black people try to find their own liberation before, 
it was actually while it was and before it was actually happening, it was like a fictional story that was mapping out this stuff. So yeah, that's yeah. Right. Uh and of course Blake um uh, Delaney will go on to to be uh the highest ranking field officer in the Union Army. And was um, friends with Frederick Douglass, the whole friends thing. With Frederick Douglass. Uh and the 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 jumping off point for that story, Blake, that Delaney created was it was actually twofold. Like I taught the students about this. One, he hated Uncle Tom's cabin, which mm -hmm. is the which was at the time this big anti-slavery, you no know, Harry Potter, right. so big anti-slavery novel. But it didn't give right. black people agency, right? Right? Like it didn't give black people agency. So Blake's got nothing. You know, he's all about agency, right? He's looking for his wife. It starts off they take his wife and he goes looking for her. Right. Uh, and so there's you know a, a, a lot going on there. Uh, as as you think about your work and you think about the experience of, of bringing infinitum to the public at this time you've alluded to you know the transformative nature of this work the transformative nature of afrofuturism uh as an artist who deals in, in visual narratives what do you think you know at some level i think every artist either instinctively or you know, sort of subconsciously or consciously says, ha, huh, I did this, you try to do better, right? Like, this is what I did. Right. What What right. do you see as the next sort of Afrofuturist story? What, what, what are the pathways that you want to explore in your future work? Like, what are the things that motivate you still as a relatively, you know, a, you know, at the height of your sort of creative powers at some level to tell some, some okay. more stories like where do you want to go okay so i will try if i meander a little bit in my answers because you you know you don't ask questions you say i'm gonna ask another question it's like 15 questions i'm like what was the first question like, you know man i'm getting older man i can't hold all that way anyway. anyway uh first of all direct sales market comics traditional comics, particularly, can be quite juvenile. Uh, not because, you know, but we exist also, the paradox, we exist in a world where comics have never been better. Never. Right. They're drawn well, they're written well. Uh, uh, so that's the other thing. The other thing is the trade industry, which is what I'm in, I'm not in a direct sales market. I'm in a trade market. You know, my colleagues are Jerry Kraft, you know, uh, 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 I guess Raina Telgemeier, even though they're in different divisions because they're with the middle grade market. The adult graphic no novel market is starting to just come into its own now, which I consider Infinitum to be, you know, a, 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 a muscle move in that direction to really set up a community where adults can get into books and feel okay about that and not feel like they're reading something that's totally juvenile. And the way you do that is you create elements in those books that appeal to sentimentality. Mm. And that's a complex process, but that's something you have to do. Uh, farther as to competition, you know, no one ever wants to say they're in competition with someone. Right. Because you don't want you don't want anyone to feel like you're paying attention to them, right? But you're asking me this question because you know Tim is crazy enough to answer it. All right, so I'll give you what you want. <laughs> I'm in competition with everybody because I want to do the best work I can. I, I don't begrudge anyone their success what they're working on, because it all adds to the story. It all adds to the community, the process of creating the work. I just don't want anyone to get in way in my in the way of me doing my stories. <laughs> you know, that's when I have an issue. And after years of struggle, that appears to have dissipated. And that's a combination of factors. One, gatekeepers can't patrol all the gates. COVID has allowed people to go through 
10 years worth of streaming content in 10 months. <laughs> Companies are trying their best to generate content in an environment where it's hard to produce new content because you could literally die while producing that said content. Uh, black people are in the updated data sets firmly acknowledged as both consumers and create content creators within the system. Uh, we don't respond well to having knees put on our necks, right? We don't respond well to that. Uh, uh, we now, it's finally occurred to us through a growth in sophistication that when we organize in mass, we are very powerful financial and vote voting block. So that means we now, you know, I'm just talking about black America. I ain't talking about it, I'm just talking about here. We prove that, oh, we need some senators. We need two senators. What are we gonna do? Oh, let's go get them. Oh, these two guys are good, let's put them in there. That's what we did, we did that. You understand? We did that. Uh, so what I want for myself, because you asked that question, what I want for myself. <sighs> Man, if I could just get, I'm 54 now. I don't know how long I got, but I, if I could just get 15, 20, 25 years of just consistent work, putting out one book after the other, putting out one film project after the other. I want to become a multi, I, I've always been a multidisciplinary artist. I'm a 3D animator, I'm a 3D modeler, I'm a 2D animator, I'm, I'm a comic book artist, graphic novelist, I write but I'm all digital. I don't even draw on paper. I'm a portrait artist. I'm, I'm probably more prolific of a portrait artist than I am a graphic novelist, which a lot of people, some people know it, but they, I mean, I've done over the last five years, 300 portraits. Most people don't even know that, you know, uh, they will though. <laughs> but but uh, so, but I'm also a lover of social media and the power. I mean, in one sense, you got to really feel bad for some gatekeepers because they had it locked down, man. They really did. They had it locked down. All of a sudden, the social media comes and it's like, ah, we don't want to, we'll, I'll just post something on Facebook. I don't need to pay you any money. It's like Facebook. They, they have these ads, right? I paid for ads. And many people will pay for ads, but they, the algorithm changes naturally, right? This, you can't blame Facebook for that. They have to make a living, but then it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to buy as many ads because it, it, you, you have to spend more money to reach more people, right? I'm utterly fascinated by that. I'm utterly fascinated that I could talk about this tie on Twitter and I said, hey, I want to wear, I have two choice for two ties, right? MSU and the webmaster, who I will not reveal her name, behind <laughs> that, picks the red tie. <laughs> so I go into, I go to sleep last night knowing it's going to be the red tie. But just before we go on, I show that I picked the red tie. That is marketing. That's real time, on the ground marketing. That are, it's, even if it connects to five people, 10 people, 20 people, 200 people, 2,000 people, it's still marketing that lives into perpetuity. Now you might say, well, what does this have to do with Afrofuturism? Afrofuturism in its present form, particularly as visual Afrofuturist practice could not adequately exist without Twitter, without Instagram, without Facebook, because it allows those images which were policed so heavily. And I can't, you know, I was one of those guys, I got decades of no's. But now it's like, I don't really have to wait for it now. You know, Maddie's Rocket was self-published. So I'm essentially able to, through technology, which has done such a great, great disservice to the ruling powers that I can workshop what the story is gonna be first and floppy format 
then put it out in a collective format on my own. And then release it, but do it well enough to where the company gave me this book based on that book. So this book's done well. Guess what the next book is? <laughs> that one. It's crazy. <laughs> so that's where we are. That's once you understand the systems and you can play within the systems. Joshua Womack got me uh, through this uh, two years ago. I was whining about not getting coverage by certain uh, 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 aspects of the media space. And she just had a conversation with two. I felt like my head was about to explode because of effectively what she was saying, none of that matters anymore. None of it matters. So you have to do this, 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 and this. And God help us, she was correct. She was 1000% correct. And it's, I'm here talking to you. <laughs> I'm literally here talking to you because of that kind of mindset. It's like, oh, you understand what I'm saying? It's, mm -hmm. I'll put it this way. Who are the most comfortable people in The Walking Dead? Most comfortable. Hmm. The most comfortable people in The Walking Dead. That's most comfortable point. people in The Walking Dead. Now, this is not a very scholarly academic question, but you'll, I'll make my point. I think probably the zombie is the problem. The, zombie. <laughs> the zombies don't fear about anyone <laughs> killing them, but even because they're already they're the majority. Right. They determine what's gonna go. <laughs> we are the zombies, Julian. <laughs> We've overrun the perimeter, the old system fell. And those who are hanging on, just trying to learn how to live in harmony with everyone else. <laughs> that's where we are. I'm sorry. That's, that that's, is the morose. That is, that is some powerful imagery. But that is, <laughs> we are the zombies and we have overrun the system. And I am so happy to be a zombie. I like red guys. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, your perspective, uh, I think, calls attention to is the fact that there is a a, a long legacy of um, Black speculative work in comics and, and, and literature and, and culture. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the inspirations that really sort of like drive Infinitum. Um, in terms of like that past work, you know, as a visual Afrofuturist who's made work for really decades, what are some of the, the key moments in your mind in terms of like that work that you want to call people's attention to because like one of the goals of the, of the show like one of my own goals was to get people to recognize people like you right like there's a lot of work that is afrofuturist out there and it's not just simply black panther right like the title beyond the black panther which is um also the title of a newspaper story that you were featured in the new york times uh like, you know, it's Thank an obvious thing. Both. I have no problem with it. Thank you for both. <laughs> I'm good uh, with both. I, I, I listen I, to him. He's just talking. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it calls our attention to the fact that there's a world of ideas. There's, there's a world right. of ideas, right? Like like you say, there's there's a, so many that it might as well be a zombie army, right? Um, it is a zombie apocalypse. We just don't <laughs> other people. We... Right. You know, zombie films, which is the genius of what George Romero did, was it really wasn't about zombies. Right. It was about society and the way human beings treat each other. That was the power of it. It was, it ex and all there was this depth in it that existed under the veneer of some viral infection where people are getting eaten by other dead humans, right? But once you got underneath that, you were talking about how man treated man and man treated woman and woman treated man and black and white and all those things, the rich and the poor. That's what Romero did for his career. And it was his, it was his, his, his greatest triumph that will outlive him. That has already does outlive him. Uh, so, to answer your question, uh, 
it's 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 that the answer is still in a state of flux to be frank because something uh what's the brother who um billy porter from pose mm -hmm. who is plays the character from pose the tv show they were interviewing him recently over the last year or two and he was talking about his career and he said i just got here so first of all i just got here so a lot of the answers that you want, a lot of the questions that you want answers to hit me back in another year or two or three. If everything comes to play like I want, then I'll be able to give you a much more detailed answer because some of this stuff is still, they're literally happening right now on a day by day. This is just one part of it, right? It's like Harper Collins, my publisher, uh, Amistad reaches the marketing department. Tim, you know, we have a library and we'd like to set you up. Do you have a date between February 25th, 23rd and the 26th? I look at my calendar and I said, I have one day left in February that I can do something. And we put it on that date for Harper Academic. I, I love those guys. And I said, March had space. So February is full. March is going to start filling up. And uh, uh, what do they say? Money doesn't solve everything, but it sure does help. And what that means, uh, I don't have anything right now, but what that means is the opportunity to get my work is the cooling balm that makes the angry Tim go away. <laughs> and happy Tim, happy Tim comes alive and happy Tim is able to say, oh, wow. You know, I want to do, go back and finish Maddie's Rocket as a three book story arc to finish that story, not leave any loose threads, right? right. Uh, there's certain things I've talked to you about I'm not going to reveal here because I got to say that for media <laughs> later, right? <laughs> about you know, the book I've just done, right. you know, but there are other stories I want. I want to do stories, uh, 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 more Star Wars-y type things. I want to do a middle grade book. I'm working on my memoirs that I'm now hopefully in discussion with a designer because I, I don't have the time to design the book myself. I've already written most of it. There's some stuff, but so those things are now, you know, have to be put together. There are film projects I'm working on. Uh, so there are things that happened in the past that I suppose the appropriate place to deal with those are in my memoirs, mm -hmm. because some of it was clearly my fault. So, you know, you know, you, you can't, you can only whine so much, you know, <laughs> at the same time, um, something my late uh, therapist, uh, Patricia Robinson, amazing woman told me, she said, Tim, make sure you record what you're going through. So I'm a avid journalist. I've been journaling since 1997. I don't journal as much. Um, well, my level of journaling fluctuates depending upon the time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I journal every year, but there's sometimes it's heavier, sometimes a little later. Uh, but she said, make sure you record what you're going through because people will need it. And that is something I've always done, you know, and I, and, I, and, and I have to remind myself, journaling isn't a race. It's not, it's not even a marathon because you're only journaling for yourself. Right. But a lot of those, that material has to go into my memoirs because people are gonna need it. And they'll need to see my own frailties, my own successes and failures, which there are numerous failures, you know, uh, but that is what I'm interested in doing now is engaging that work because I think that work adds to it fills in the blanks, man. People are like, why are you doing Black Metropolis? Why are you doing that book? Because initially Black Metropolis was a science fiction story that I attempted to tell three different times and failed each time, you know, mostly due to lack of resources and money and divorce and all the other stuff. Oh, that tie is coming there a little bit loose there. So I might have to take it off there. The illusion is going away. Anyway, so 
I think, ah, ah. <laughs> ah, let me take that off. Anyway, now I look like an Amish guy. Anyway, <laughs> I have abilities, I can change. Anyway, so the, why would you do Black Metropolis? And it's because Black Metropolis, 90% of the work, there are hundreds of drawings in Black Metropolis, hundreds. Not like sketches, just get, like fully painted, rendered stuff that's never been seen except for a few people saw some of the stuff by some of my shows, but I couldn't put everything in there. So Black Metropolis will serve as a significant component of the missing history of visual Afrofuturism on the planet Earth. And people will say, well, wow, that's arrogant. Yeah, it certainly felt that way when I was starving while doing it. <laughs> so I have a responsibility as an Afrofuturist. Like your job is to interview me and people like me record, create text, create shows. My job is to create visuals. And those visuals that have not been seen, I am now going to collect them so that I can do my service to our community to fill in that detail that's been missing. That's my purpose from now on till when I die. Wow, uh, that's a really, that's a really profound statement. I, I know I that- That's unprofound, man. I can make it unprofound. <laughs> no, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, as a, 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 a artist, who is uh, in the midst of a, a, a dynamic project and, and selling that project and with a long history with a, with a genre that uh, is taking up more and more of the public's, public sphere, the public imagination. It is. Uh, all, all those things um, become really, really inescapable. Uh, one of the things that has defined um, the a show and having you know, artists like yourself in the show is a recurring theme for so many people has been, I know I've never seen anything like this before. Where can I, where can I, where can I get uh, these comics? Like, you know, yeah, this is just so new to me. And for us in who sort of familiar with this stuff, it's hard to, uh, for us to remember how transformative it was the first time we saw it, right? Like how transformative it was when and then when it was revealed, when that world was revealed to us, because we're sort of living in that world. Uh, and now that 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 work is is really becoming a part and parcel of how we, we can imagine a speculative past, right? Right. Uh, and, and so that's the the really sort of like transformative nature of the work and trans transformative nature of, of, of your work. Um, you know, you're on tour right now, and as you say, there's always something more for you to do. But I am curious, like, you know, are there Afrofuturist work that you're reading going like, wow, this is great. <laughs> like, you know, like, what, what are some of the things that on in a little bit of downtime you have that you're checking out right now? Well, not a lot of downtime, first of all. Right. Uh, uh, but what I have done is because there was a point where I lost a lot of my books. Hell, that was a point where I lost a lot of my art and was recovered. 10, 15 years later, which that will be in my memoirs. <laughs> but <laughs> to ask your question, uh, I just got this in yesterday and I'm, I'm curious to see what's in it. Black this is history. Future. Oh, okay. This is history and it's important, but very few people I know are in this. So we got to write more history. Does that make sense when I'm saying this is good? Right. Great. This is good. That's great. More. Less talking. Well, talk, but talk after you finish. <laughs> Less talking, more finishing. When you finish, you can talk. And trust me. I love to talk. It's gotten me. <laughs> now I can talk a lot because I finished. 
But even there, there's going to come a point where I can't talk as much. I got to tamp that down and get to work on my next book. Because right. that's going to be another train that you got to get on. More production, more production, more production. Uh, Hip hop succeeded because they produce. Right. Don't matter what you think of it, they get it done. Right. Right. They right. get it done. And as a result of get it, getting it done, financial systems, social systems, cultural systems developed underneath that, creating an economy around it. That's what has to be done with Afrofuturism. Okay. We need more production. So that book, uh, I'm obviously looking forward to the Megascope line of books. I have my books up there. There's a plethora of independent artists. Jerome Walford is great. Micheline Hess is great. Uh, uh, the Tuskegee Airs guys are great. The, the uh, you know, I could go forever. The, you know, John Jennings, obviously the whole mega scope group is great. Um, so I read those books, but then you got even deeper independence with excellence by Carrie Randolph and, and uh, uh, Brandon Thomas is out there. They're doing their thing. So we're active, very, very active. But then you got the film thing you know, you have the film thing, but then you have the comic to film thing, which is starting to happen right. for black content. You know, Bitterroot, and Naomi just got signed. Right. Infinitum, it's happening. That just it, it just is. You know, you can't go into specifics, but it's happening. You know, because of that, Maddie's Rocket probably is going to happen sooner than later. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, more production more finishing, more production, more finishing. For uh, people who want to catch you, what's your next big public event? Uh, where, where can I find, find your, uh, your virtual book, book tour details? Uh, uh, well, you know, that's interesting that you would say that. I am finding, finding that I have to be very careful of Overhyping every event. Okay. Hey, you said you wanted to interview me. I did. I gave you an answer. I'll give you an answer, right? So some events I go all in on. Some events I have to pull back on because I just had another event the day before. So I'm just repeating myself over and over again, trying to be creative in how I do it. Now, I don't want to reveal all of the different intricacies, what I call the uh, Greyhound paradox. <laughs> you know what the Greyhound paradox is, right? Uh, the Greyhound so. paradox is, I've said it before in interviews, but I'll say it here. It's when you're going from one book event to the next, but you have to take a Greyhound bus to get there. And it's not glamorous. It's, it's all of the unglamorous stuff because this is work. Right. So people say, oh, you're not working now. No, this is work. Touring behind a book, promoting a book, interviewing about a book, pumping the book, making images, updating your website, updating the ecosphere around your website, making sure. It's like, look, Harper does a fantastic job, but I also have to reach out and pitch to journalists. Hell, I pitch to you. <laughs> That's what has to happen. Is what has to happen if you if you're serious about the work. Now, well, maybe one day I'll become like Stephen King or something like that, and you know I can just oh well, it's self perpetual you know self perpetuating it does it itself. They come to me, yeah, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> so let me do what I got to do. Uh, Infinitum is available everywhere you can find books. Everywhere and Beyond the Black Panther. Uh, Visions of Afrofuturism of American Comics is a virtual exhibit available now. So if you go to the MSU uh, website, the MSU Museum website, go to current ex exhibitions, they'll take you right to it. Uh, Tim, it's been, as always, really a great honor to talk to you about your work and get you, you, your insights about the work and some of the inspirations about that and your reflections on this sort of cultural moment as someone who's been in there for so long. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to stop here uh, and talk with us about, about the work today. 
you well, man, that is just such a, a, a what's the word, dour kind of send off. Man, he's fantastic with it, man. Thank you, MSU. Thank you, MSU. You guys are the bomb. MSU Museum. You right. guys are awesome. You guys do it. Go to their school. They have a great cartooning program. They are fantastic teachers. <laughs> they bring people like me in. Right. Don't buy, don't buy their stuff. Go to their school. Wow, I don't, I don't even need to say anything more, Tim. You just write that. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> right. So yeah, the, you forget that Denise that? has to say something, and Denise always ends on a really. Oh uh, no! Nah, don't try to put it off on her, man. Don't try to put it off on her. That's you. Who did Denise, that. Is a, Denise is a professional. Right? Like what are you? <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tim. This was just fantastic. What a thought provoking awesome. and so engaging. I just, I, I learned so much, I'll and I just, I. And I'm so glad that we were able to share your thoughts and all of the, the things that you're doing with our audience. I just can't wait for people to, to hear this talk online and to spread the word. Um, so thank you again for being here. Thank you to Dr. Chambliss for, for being part of the discussion today. That's my man. Um, 